Hi, I'm Phil Keller from Metrolab. I'd like to tell you about a technology for measuring magnetic fields, Hall technology. When we hear the term magnetometer, or the older term Gauss meter, most of us are thinking about a Hall magnetometer. And it's true that Hall magnetometers occupy a very important place on this diagram where we're categorizing uh, all the different uh, field measurement techniques on the uh, basis of the range that they cover and the precision that they give you. As you can see, red area covers a, a large area uh, that gives you a wide range of uh, uh, field ranges and uh, with a decent amount of precision. So let's take a closer look at Hall magnetometers. Modern Hall mag uh, um, sensors are built out of semiconductors, and three geometries are commonly used. The traditional planar Hall geometry is a four-terminal device. The current flows across two terminals, and the other two terminals are, are used to measure a voltage. It measures a uh, magnetic field that is normal to the plane of the cross. The, the voltage output is roughly proportional to the uh, flux density, and the sign of the voltage indicates the direction of the field. The more recently developed vertical uh, Hall geometry uh, is a five-terminal device. The current is injected on one terminal and then is split so the current flows in two different directions and is extracted on two different uh, uh, terminals. The plane of, uh, that is sensitive to is parallel to the, uh, uh, to the plane of the semiconductor. And uh, because the current is flowing in two different directions, you will get a differential voltage uh, that is measured uh, between those two voltage terminals where, once again, the, the uh, magnitude of the voltage indicates the field strength and the sign indicates the direction of the magnetic field. By combining a single planar Hall element with two vertical Hall elements, we can today create a sensor, a so-called integrated three-axis sensor, that is sensitive to all three axes, that, that will give you the measure at one single point, the, both the X, Y, and Z uh, directions, uh, uh, components of the magnetic field. The Hall technique has several important benefits. First of all, it's an electronic device, essentially acting as a resistive bridge, and it therefore also benefits from the evolution of electronic manufacturing. Secondly, it's quite fast with bandwidths that go up into the tens of kilohertz quite easily. Third, the sensitivity can be varied either by varying the bias current or by uh, changing the amplification of the voltage signal. Therefore, we can cover with a single sensor a large range of magnetic fields. Finally, as, we can, as we've seen, you can, with a single sensor, measure all three components of the magnetic field. Therefore, you're, this is about the closest we can get to having a single point three, a three axis uh, magnetic field measurement. However, the Hall technique also has some important disadvantages or limitations. First of all, it suffers from zero field offset. This means that you measure a voltage even if there is no field presence. For example, in the traditional Hall element, if we offset the voltage terminals one relative to the other, you will uh, have an, uh, an offset voltage. Secondly, it suffers from nonlinearity, especially on the extremities when the sensor starts to saturate. Hall sensors also suffer from noise. We model this noise generally by, uh, with two components, a 1RF component and a white noise flat spectral component. The 1RF component is the one that really bugs us because it gives very large uh, errors uh, error voltages at the lower frequencies. The Hall sensor output is also temperature dependent due to the change of the number of conductors in the conduction band as the temperature changes. This affects both the offset as well as the gain of the device. 
Similar effects can be caused by aging of the semiconductor as the dopants in the semiconductor diffuse. The planar hall effect is another error signal that results from anisotropic magnetoresistance. This is an effect that is not sensitive to a field normal to the plane, but to fields in the plane, in particularly at a maximum at the 45 degree angles between the current and the voltage lead. Then the leads of the Hall device, the, the wires that actually lead to the current and the voltage uh, terminals, they are subject to Faraday induction. So as this device moves through a, uh, a non-uniform field, uh, it will induce um, voltages that have nothing to do with, uh, with the Hall voltage. They are just uh, voltages induced on the terminal. And finally, uh, this is not a very common problem, but as you approach absolute zero, so in cryogenic applications, the Hall voltage becomes quantized uh, and does no longer gives you this nice linear response that we're looking for. So that's quite a long list of things that can go wrong. Now, to take care of most of these, the most important thing is to calibrate. And for a simple calibration, if all you want to do is do a gain offset kind of calibration, two or three points uh, at the extremities and at zero, for example, uh, are, are sufficient. But if you want to take advantage, uh, take uh, correct for the nonlinearity, then you may need to take many, many more points. You also need to calibrate at at least two temperatures to compute the temperature coefficients of both the gain as well as the offset, because both of those will vary with temperature. Two or three axis sensors require calibration on each of the axes, plus additional measurements to determine any angular errors. And this entire calibration uh, procedure needs to be repeated regularly every year or every 18 months uh, to, take uh, to, to correct for aging uh, of the semiconductor material, uh, for example, as the dopants diffuse through the semiconductor material. So as you can see, these benefits of the, um, of the Hall uh, sensor, they're kind of relative. You have to pay for them with lots of very good calibration. Okay, so calibration is very important, point taken. Now, we can also do something about this noise. As you can see, especially the 1 over F noise, if we were be able, uh, able to operate at a higher frequency instead of, so get ourselves away from DC, we can reduce the noise dramatically. And what this is, is instead of doing a DC bias current, one uses an AC bias current which allows you to move away and reduce the, uh, uh, the noise quite dramatically. At the same time, synchronous detection can throw out a lot of out-of-band noise. So most high-precision uh, Hall magnetometers use these techniques to minimize the noise. Finally, the spinning current technique is a more recent technique that switches the voltage and the current terminals. So the direction of the current goes from being horizontal to being vertical, and then back the other way on the, on the horizontal, but flowing the other way, and then vertical flowing the other way. So the current sort of spins around, hence the name, spinning current. It turns out that the sign of the planar Hall effect, as well as the offsets, is reversed if you switch the voltage and the, uh, and the current leads. However, it has no effect on the uh, sign of the thing that you're actually trying to measure, the uh, magnetic field strength. So if you average the readings as the current spins, you will end up canceling most of the errors due to offset and planar Hall effect. In addition, the spinning current acts very much like the AC excitation, and ends up eliminating much out-of-band noise. So all in all, spinning current is a very powerful technique, but it is actually quite difficult to implement cleanly uh, with discrete components. So it really comes into its own more recently with the integrated sensors that allow you to put all the uh, 
the uh, the hull sensors themselves, the uh, um, current source, the amplifiers, the spinning cur- uh, uh, current switches, all that on a single chip. And here we can actually pull uh, the, uh, the full benefit uh, from the spinning current technique. So there's a, te- a, a small peek behind the scenes of the hall technique. Now, as you can see, it's not nearly as, as simple as it would seem, um, but if you calibrate them well and uh, take advantage of all these techniques to cancel out the major errors, you can get very precise measurements and absolutely no competition in terms of ease of use and range of measurements uh, and, flexib- and overall flexibility. So thank you very much for listening and see you next time.